So, Paul, we mentioned stars as being a source of ultraviolet photons, but I also noticed your spectrum of a quasar had a lot of ultraviolet photons, too. So, how about quasars being the things that reionize re the universe? Yes, as we talked about in the last lesson, quasars put out prodigious amounts of ultraviolet from the inner parts of their accretion disks. So, surely they're a very good contender for producing these very hard energetic photons that could reionize the universe. This occurred to people a long time ago, and so they started trying to search to find if there are enough bright quasars in the early universe to do this. Now, normally the way you find quasars, uh, we talked about you find them by the radio emission, but most quasars don't emit radio waves. So normally the way quasars are found is look for very bright blue objects. But when we get quasars at these enormous distances, that's not going to work anymore, because if you remember, all the light that's below 10.2 electron volts is being eaten up by all these absorption lines. So that absorbs a large fraction of that light. So in fact, it turns out when the quasars get to beyond a certain distance, about a redshift of three or four, they become very red. The flux, the amount of radiation we pick up at um, optical blue wavelengths is absorbed by all this gas, where there's still this flux at longer wavelengths gets through. So the Sloan Digital Sky Survey was a huge survey of the northern sky, and they mapped hundreds of millions of objects looking for things that looked like stars, but had incredibly red colors. So I guess this is their biggest, our most distant object they saw, this tiny little red smudge right in the center. It doesn't look like much, but it's at a redshift of 6.4. That's a long ways back. This is a real needle in a haystack problem. They, they would look at you know, maybe a billion stars looking for three or four things at these sort of distances. So it's one in a billion problem. It's actually much worse than finding a needle in a haystack, which is only a one in a million problem. Right, so, all right. So they found this one at 6.4. I know there were ones they found lots and lots of quasars in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Were there enough to cause the universe to be reionized? Well, they plotted the number of quasars versus time, so versus redshift. Um, they have to, you have to correct for the fact that space is expanding, but this is um, after you correct for that, how many quasars there are per what would be a unit volume today, what's called a co-moving volume, and you find there aren't very many quasars today, as we talked about earlier. There are a lot of quasars out at about a redshift of two, but there really weren't very many out at redshifts of five or six or so on, which is when you might expect when you need this realization to occur. So you showed us your spectrum of a quasar is from right here, and I guess the uh, universe... Uh, is re re completely reionized then at that point. Yes. It seems to be changing in this area. But there's fewer and fewer objects as we yeah. go back in time. So there are quasars up here and all the way back down here, which are still not showing solid absorption. They have the narrow individual absorption lines, but they're not showing continuous gun Peterson absorption. So something must have reionized most of the gas in the universe before the age of the quasars. This is the age of the quasars, about 10 billion light years ago. Before that, so that means quasars can't really do this. There just weren't enough of them early enough. They came along too late. Right. And so there is an interesting surprise, though, that came out of these really high redshift ones, which is looking at that Lyman Alpha forest. You can see, as we look at a redshift of 5.7, 5.8, there's a bunch of spectrum here, spectra of quasars uh, ordered by their redshift. And you can see... They're becoming more and more redshifted as you go further and further. And these are the most distant quasars known. And you can see that they're all chopped up here. But something happens. Yes, so down here, this is the Lyman Alpha emission line. So what we would expect, remember, if the universe was full of neutral hydrogen is no light, short words of this. And the ones down here, they don't have much light, but they have some. Yep. This is the Lyman Alpha forest we've been talking about. The light gets, is chewed up by individual clouds. But in between the clouds, the gas has been ionized. But something strange happens by the time you get up to a little bit above redshift 6, maybe. You really do seem to be picking up nothing here. It's not going to be a bit more picking up over there, but really very little indeed, especially at the top one over there. So it's actually looking like the prediction. It looks like up at these redshifts of the 6.4 or so, there really is neutral hydrogen everywhere. So that's interesting. So... One of the problems, of course, is going to be if we want to go out and find even more distant quasars, maybe there are more distant quasars, and we just simply can't see them because this is, of course, where we're looking, the optical light. They're not emitting any optical light. They're only emitting infrared light. Yeah, we'd really like to see if this trend continues. It kind of looks like we've identified when the universe became ionized. Up here, no flux. 
so that means the universe hydrogen gas is neutral. Down here, we are seeing flux, albeit not very much. So somewhere between redshift 6 and redshift 5 or so, that seems to be when it happened. But we'll have to check that by finding more distant quasars, and that's really hard. But thanks to new infrared detectors, which used to be tiny little pieces of uh, weird types of things like uh, mercury, well, cadmium, telluride, indium, antimonide. Yeah, all sorts of weird uh, elements put together in to make these detectors. Well, they've made those much bigger, and so they've been able to go out and search many thousands of square degrees in the infrared now, mm -hmm. and they found one really distant object, but only one. Yep. And it's this object, this little red thing there. This is not a visible light image. In visible light image is just completely blank. Right. What they've done here is what they've shown red here is actually infrared wavelengths. And so you're looking for something that shows up at infrared, but it's absolutely gone at optical wavelengths. So we can take a spectrum of this with a very big telescope. And what do we see? Well, we see a normal quasar. And then, wham, below that magic 10.2 electrons, nothing. So it seems like there is a real trend here, which beyond a redshift, a redshift of six or so, the universe seems to be full of neutral hydrogen, like we sort of expected it should be. Uh, and that seems to be when the era of reionization occurred. It also looks like it's all done and dusted. Um, the universe started off very hot. Um, at redshift about 1,000, it cooled down enough to become neutral. It stayed neutral all the way down to redshift about 6 when something, but not quasars, put out enough ultraviolet to ionize it again. Nice and simple. So, Paul, we seem to have this indication that the universe went through this change at a redshift of 6. But there's a problem. And that problem comes from the observations of that cosmic microwave background. Because when we look at the cosmic microwave background, which we understand exquisitely well, we realize that it doesn't quite look pristine. Instead, it's like it has a fog in front of it. And that fog is because 9% of the photons of the cosmic microwave background appear to be scattered. And we're pretty sure they'd be scattering off electrons. And the electrons, of course, there because the universe is reionized. So, in itself, doesn't sound like a problem. Sure, but you can calculate when this must happen. So, as you know, um, if gas is neutral, the microwave background doesn't interact with it, so you need electrons to scatter photons. But you've got to imagine a microwave background photon flying through. It starts off with neutral gas, so it's transparent. And then as time goes on, space is getting bigger and bigger. And then at some point, it becomes ionized, presumably by these whatever these mysterious ultraviolet sources are. But if that happens too late, the density is very low, because density is dropping very fast with as time goes on. And so while there are electrons around there, there won't be enough of them in the path of any given microwave background photon to scatter it. So the same, it turns out we need these electrons to be produced, that is to say the gas to be ionized, pretty early while the density is still high enough to intercept a fair fraction, 9%, of the microwave background photons. So if you go through and you calculate how long and how dense, so you, you know, the longer you have to go, the denser, so it's really two things compounding on each other, you can figure it out. And so when you do that calculation, it turns out the universe needs to be reionized or it needs to be ionized or reionized from a redshift of zero to about 10. Now that 10 is a lot bigger than what seems to be indicated by the quasars. So if, as we thought from the quasars, everything got ionized around redshift 6, that wouldn't be enough to produce this. Basically, by that point, the density has got so low, it would only be scattering a smaller percent, maybe 3 or 4% of the microwave background photons. To get the percentage up as high as we observe, it has to have been ionized up about redshift 10. So we have a problem here. So we do have yet another mystery.